வணக்கம் பிங் ஆன் ஷலோம் ஐ ஃபெல்ட் மை ஹார்ட் ஸ்ட்ரேஞ்ச்லி வார்ம் மெத்தடிஸ் செலிப்ரேட் ஆல்டஸ் கேட் டே பிகாஸ் இட் வாஸ் ஆன் ஆல்டஸ் கேட் ஸ்ட்ரீட் லண்டன் தட் ஜான் வெஸ்லி had an experience which he described in these words i felt my heart strangely warmed this is why someone has said that even though some churches prefer to emphasize the head for correct thinking and others highlight the hands for correct doing methodists should stress the heart for correct feeling of course Most would agree that head, heart and hands are equally important. Our Lord Jesus commanded us to love God with our heart, our mind and our strength together. But since it is the week where Methodists highlight Wesley's heart-warming experience, I shall focus today on the heart or our feelings. This is what Jesus does in one of his most famous parables the so called good samaritan it was feelings of compassion which moved the samaritan to stop and help the injured man and these good feelings of compassion led the samaritan to good actions the good deeds of providing first aid and and more but why samaritan Why did Jesus choose to make a Samaritan the good example of compassionate feelings and good deeds of mercy? Let me offer two guesses. Guess number 1. Maybe Jesus was inspired to make a Samaritan the hero of his story because of a much earlier good Samaritan story. This earlier story is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, which was written at least 500 years before Christ. That story was set in a context of war and military invasion. Samaria was one of the biggest cities in Israel. Israel and Judah were at war. Samaria was used to refer to the whole state of Israel. I guess in the way a New Yorker could be either someone from New York City or from the state of New York. In any case, Samaritans were from Samaria, that is Israel. Samaria or Israel lay to the north of Judah. They were neighboring countries or states. But as sometimes happens, neighbors become enemies at war. Verse 6 tells us that the army of King Pekah of Israel or Samaria had killed 120,000 soldiers from Judah. In addition, read verses 8 Uh, and nine these samaritan israelites captured 200,000 women and children and took whatever they wanted presumably cows sheep precious stones no geneva war convention back then this was typical behavior in ancient warfare the spoils go to the victor sadly even after geneva soldiers today rape and pillage people and land Verse 9 tells us that when the Samaritan army came back to Samaria, a prophet named Oded met them and scolded them in the name of God. God gave you victory over Judah because God was angry with Judah, but but the cruel rage with which you have killed so many of them has reached up to heaven and made God angry. Verse 10 How dare you bring their women and children back as your slaves? Take them all back to Judah or God's anger will fall upon you. The response of these Samaritan soldiers is incredible. It's as if today a Russian Orthodox priest were to send an email or text message to a Russian general fighting in Ukraine, warning him in the name of God to provide food and medical aid to Ukrainian citizens. who are trying to avoid capture and death and wouldn't it be wonderfully shocking if that general actually listened to that priest or prophet and showed compassion and kindness notice how the prophet appeals to these soldiers of war firstly he says we are all brothers verse 11 the people of judah are your brothers 
NIV paraphrases brothers as fellow Israelites. The English Standard Version uses relatives. But the Hebrew storyteller consistently uses the more intimate term, brothers. It's the same word, brothers, again, in verses 8 and 15. How can you treat your brothers, your cousins, your family so cruelly? The logic is sound and compelling. Sadly, human history has shown us again and again that family feuds and fights are sometimes the fiercest. Brothers, sisters, this should not be so. Secondly, we are all sinners. Verse 10. Aren't we also guilty of sins against God? Of course we are. So maybe you are right to think that these Jews are sinners and they deserve the destruction that they have brought upon themselves. But even if this is correct, don't you know that you are also a sinner and that you too may one day suffer for your sins? And when we are suffering for our sins, wouldn't we hope for some compassion and kindness rather than to be treated cruelly and without mercy? So how can you treat your brothers and sisters with such contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. Amazingly, these Samaritans turn out to become good Samaritans. Verse 15, they return the Jewish women and children safely to Jericho, a city on the border between Samaria and Judah. They gave them clothes and sandals, fed them, gave them drink, put healing ointment on their wounds, led all their feeble ones on donkeys, and brought them to Jericho. This language is also used in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan applied healing ointment to the wounds of the injured man, put the man on his donkey, and brought him safely to Jericho. Both stories urge us to feel compassion and to show kindness to people who are suffering. We are all brothers and sisters, fellow human beings. We are all sinners. Should we not treat each other with more compassion? The Second Chronicles Good Samaritan's story is set in a context of international military wars. The story speaks to humane conduct of enemy survivors and civilians. It is obviously an important passage in the Bible's view on the conduct of war. Jesus' Good Samaritan story is set not in the context of an international war, but in the context of ordinary relationships, daily life on the streets of Jerusalem and Samaria. We might say that Instead of highlighting our military enemies, Jesus focuses on our social or cultural enemies. And this is a second guess as to why Jesus chose a Samaritan to be the hero of his story. At the time of Jesus, Jews and Samaritans were still social or cultural enemies enemies. We have already seen from the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 that Jews and Samaritans had fought in the past with the Samaritans winning that bloody war in chapter 28. At least two other terrible wars in the 8th century BC between these not very brotherly brothers are mentioned in the Bible. The Jews and Samaritans also fought theological wars. 
Jews and Samaritans, both claimed to worship the God of Abraham and Moses. But each accused the other of being a cult or a corruption of the true faith. About 120 years or so before Christ was born, there was a 15-year-long battle between Jews and Samaritans. It culminated in the Jews attacking and destroying the Samaritan holy temple which had been built on Mount Gerizim. Jews believed that that Samaritan temple was an abomination to God because the only true temple was in Jerusalem. Then in about 86, when Jesus was a young boy, some Samaritans broke into the broke into the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and they desecrated it with human bones. I recount these depressing incidents of hostility to explain the deep hatred and fear that existed between Jews and Samaritans in the time of Jesus. If you wanted to insult a fellow Jew, you called him a Samaritan. That is how some Jewish bishops insulted Jesus soon after Jesus had come to the defense of a woman who had been shamed for committing adultery. The Jewish bishops and Pharisee pastors, they were deba debating amongst themselves whether or not this woman should be stoned. Jesus preferred to show compassion. And so he challenged those Jewish religious leaders, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. It's very similar to what the prophet Oded had said to the Samaritans in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, some 700 years earlier. Remember, he said, aren't we also guilty of sins against God? The Jewish bishops and Pharisee pastors scolded Jesus saying, we are right to call you a Samaritan and demon-possessed. They did not mean this as a compliment. The word Samaritan was an insult if you were a Jew to be called a Samaritan. Jesus experienced this animosity himself because Samaritans also did not like Jews. When Jesus was passing through a Samaritan village, Luke chapter 9 verses 52 and 53, states the outcome rather calmly. The Samaritans there did not welcome him. But it must have been a rather hostile rejection, enough to make Jesus' Jewish disciples react very angrily. They said, Master, let's ask God to bring fire down from heaven to destroy every one of those Samaritans. Jesus rebuked them. Such was the tension and animosity that existed between Jews and Samaritans in the time of Jesus, the Jew. And then one day, when a Jewish Old Testament lecturer asked Jesus, God tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers with a story about a Jewish bishop, a Jewish worship leader, and a Samaritan. And then Jesus says to this Jewish Bible expert, you ask me who is your neighbor? Well, which one of these three persons do you think was a neighbor? The Jewish expert knows the answer. It is the only possible humane answer. It was the, perhaps he could not find it in himself to say the word Samaritan, but he knew the answer. It was the Samaritan who proved to be the neighbor. Can you, O oh Bible expert, can you accept your social and cultural enemy, your theological enemy, whose beliefs and values you denounce as corrupt and liberal. Can you accept that Samaritan is also a neighbor whom God wants you to love? 
Jesus still commands us today to love God by loving our neighbours. And some of us might well ask the same question, but Lord, who is my neighbour? What story would Jesus tell us in reply? Who would Jesus choose to be the good Samaritan in his answer to us? Who would be the neighbour that Jesus wants us to love? Who is our enemy? Is it an irritating neighbour who lives next to your home? Is it a calculating colleague or supervisor who has stabbed you in the back? Is it a brother or sister who does nothing to help you look after your aging mother? Jesus' parable speaks of a priest and a Levite, people who are in charge of conducting the proper worship of God. So let me close by, by guessing how Jesus might have told the parable if he was speaking to us today. Once upon a time, there was a Methodist bishop who was having coffee along Beach Road. Suddenly, he saw a man attacking a woman with a chopper in his hand. The woman screamed for help. The bishop quickly got up and moved far away to safety. Also having coffee at the stall was an assistant Methodist pastor, not yet ordained. He saw the woman in danger, but he also quickly got up and left. After all, since the bishop left, I better follow him. John was also there. John is not a bishop nor a pastor. He is just an ordinary member of the Methodist Church. He also saw the woman in distress. John rose to help, but... But unfortunately, Jesus did not include John in his story. So neither will I. Instead, Jesus introduces stuck-up Sam. Stuck-up Sam thinks that Christians are stupid to believe in God. Sam was divorced and he was hoping to remarry and he did. And he says now that pastors are hypocrites because a pastor refused to bless his second marriage. Sam tells his children never to mix with Christians because he says that Christians are so narrow-minded and judgmental. See how they oppose Pink Dot and 377A? But when stuck-up Sam saw the man attacking the woman, he immediately got up to protect her and chase the man away. And then Jesus said, Who proved to be a real neighbour to that woman? But the bishop refused to answer. He walked away. And Jesus turned to all and said, If you really love me, love your neighbour, even if he is your enemy. Let's take time to pray. God of love and truth, please save me from the truth that, that teaches my head to condemn. Warm my heart instead with the truth that sets us free to show compassion to our neighbours and to love those whom we think are our enemies. May our hearts be strangely warmed to love you by loving our enemies. Amen.